of years and has co-hosted and produced the weekly TV show The Travel Guys for the last 14 years. And this Sunday, his new TV show with co-host Lita Leapins, our City TV Tonight Day's views on Joy TV at 12.30. So please welcome Jim Gordon. Thanks, everybody. Well, we've got a good small crowd, but I'm glad everybody's here tonight. We'll have some good fun. And I'm, I personally am very excited to, uh, to bring this man on stage. I have been nice to him backstage. I don't want to make him feel old, but I have been watching this man and the, the variety of work he's been doing for over four decades. So I want to get to a little sampling of that right now, and then we'll bring our guest of honor out. So please, take a look at the screen. Mr. Alan Thick. Last time you were in Whistler? Uh, a summer ago, uh, a couple of years back. Um, I haven't been here for uh, winter fun for a while, but uh, I made it a couple of times in the summer, brought family, great time. Yeah. Zip lining is what I remember most. Oh, nice. And I was you know, wetting my pants going <laughs> over some canyon. Well, that's uh, the reason I ask you that is I, I'm a, a Toronto and Ontario boy, and, and uh, you grew up in the glamorous city of Kirkland Lake, which I've been through many times. But uh, tell me, uh, tell us uh, uh, about growing up in northern Ontario. You know, the greatest thing about it was uh, the very family oriented, small communities. This was a gold mining community. I went to high school in a, a uranium mining community. And uh, uh, sadly, these uh, communities really are kind of drying up. 
now, um, and uh, the, the official statistic about Kirkland Lake now is that population is 10,000 and they have 15,000 in the cemetery. Yeah. So, and I only get up there for funerals, it's, it's true, there's just not much going on. And uh, uh, th those towns are, uh, are, are disappearing. But it was a f great place to grow up, uh, partly because of that community, also because of the education. You know, the, nowadays you pay 30,000 a year for, uh, you know, your, 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 your uh, kid's education, and it probably wouldn't be quite as good as uh, what I remember the uh, community schools to be like way back then up there. So uh, I, I loved it and uh, wouldn't have traded that. And made a point of taking my kids up there just about every year when they were teenagers, just for a couple of reasons. Because they live in LA, I thought it would be good if they saw a blue sky. <laughs> and, and also just to see kind of where you come from and what, uh, and why you work hard, you know, because yeah. you don't want to be there for the rest of your life. It's interesting though, and this is no one better or worse, but you know, I grew up in a relatively small suburb of Toronto, and there's always just, there's people that are gonna leave, and there are people that are gonna stay. And, and that's, as I said, neither is good or better or worse or bad, but uh, you obviously looked at the big world out there and said, I'm, I'm, you know, heading to Western where you went to school. Was that, did you have that at a young age where a small town life is good, I'm not, not kicking it, but that uh, I'm gonna go see what's out there? Well, my, my dad was uh, ambitious, came from a large family, and uh, none of them had ever gone to university. And uh, he did. He went to uh, Western, where the rest of us all ended up following. He's still uh, practicing medicine today at the age of 87, yeah. uh, just outside Toronto. And uh, he's uh, flying his own plane, and he's playing golf. I've seen him punt, so I won't get in the plane with him. <laughs> a little shaky. But, uh, but he instilled in all of us uh, an ambition to just see more, do more, get out, go someplace. If you want to come back to Kirkland Lake, fine, but yeah. know that there's another world out there and maybe some other dreams you want to follow. You go to Western, what was your plan at Western? I know it, I found it interesting, uh, and not, but not surprising that you were doing radio, college radio and everything. Did you have a plan when you went to Western? Uh, I didn't have a plan, so uh, I was enrolled, I began in theology. I was threatening to be a minister. And uh, I was in a denominational school at Western. And, uh, and then I went from there into medicine, uh, which was God's way of punishing me for considering the clergy. <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and I fainted out of uh, medical school. I wow. literally, I, I, I passed out, I saw, you know, I saw, Guy getting stitches in his eyes. I was there for that class. Boom, fainted. <laughs> so a guy getting a cast sawed off his leg. You know, before Arthur Scott, we had a whole you know stovepipe cat, and uh, I saw that and I fainted. Yeah. <clears throat> and then when I told my dad I was dropping out of medical school, he fainted. <laughs> Worst fainting I ever did was uh, I saved it for when my my first son was born. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, uh, I, I saw what was going on, it wasn't pretty, <laughs> and I fainted. No surprise that my wife, I also fainted during conception, so uh, <laughs> you just know when you're not cut out for something. So what, what, then, so what was, uh, you're looking around, you're at Western, I mean, what, what, what's interesting? I think it's important uh, in this business, maybe more than any other, to have mentors. And I did have a mentor um, who was a local radio personality, his name is Bill Brady. Happy to say I saw him about a month ago when I went back and visited Western for an event. And um, he kind of took me under his wing in about my second year of college. And uh, he, he did a lot of appearances around the community, you know, for charities. And uh, he was a funny guy, told a few jokes. And he had seen me at a, at, a, at a show in Western where I had done a monologue and did a song. And, and he said, come with me and, and uh, come and do a couple of these dates with me. So, and he paid me 25 bucks a night. And uh, I got to do some, some dates where I was performing and uh, with him. He was the, the straight man. He would set me up and, and did a couple of characters. And uh, that was terribly valuable. And then uh, when I was looking for something to do uh, after my BA, um, he helped me get a job at a local radio station. 
I was writing advertising copy by day, and by night I was the all-night DJ. Hmm. I was, uh, out in fact, delivered the next skew dick on much more music station. <laughs> Spin them round and round. And, and, and I was so bad. Yeah. Very nice, yes. yes. But what happened, they used to have, there used to be a one guy who was called the announce operator, and, and you'd play the, the record, you'd spin the records, and you would do the talking. And I was, the, the, you know, I, I'm still that way today with my cell phone, but I was so lousy at the technology that they, I ended up bringing a guy in who would spin the record, so all I had to do was talk. I couldn't do it both at the same time. <laughs> so I ended up making no money because they were deducting this. And I think he was making more than me. But uh, it was a great opportunity. I did it for a whole summer and then uh, went from there to the CBC. Talk about um, CBC in like the late 60s, early 70s. Uh, different environments. Uh, was, there, was there a lot of opportunity there? I mean, I've talked to old timers that were there and, and it just, it's a different environment. It's a it, it was uh, really, uh, again, in, in the mentor department. Uh, had a guy there who mentored me, and uh, it was absolutely invaluable. And in the way they, you know, they call it the Mother CBC, mm -hmm. and that's true. The 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 uh, valuable experience that so many of us got up there, um, and then and, and it was because they paid you so lousy that you had to do a bunch of jobs. You know, you would be. I was uh, writing uh, for a, a, a radio talk show featuring Juliet and Alex Trebek. I'm writing that, that show, and then I was singing on another show once a week, and uh, writing the Tommy Hunter show, if anybody's old enough. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Remember Tommy Hunter. And uh, so you're doing a, a lot of jobs at once, and the most significant, I suppose, relative to what I ended up doing, uh, was a show produced by Lorne Michaels. Uh, and, uh, and he was a fledgling writer at the, at the time. He's only a couple of years older than, than I am. Uh, but he was cutting his comedy variety teeth uh, mm -hmm. at the CBC and using a few of us uh, in a kind of a rep company, Victor Garber, Gilda Radner, mm -hmm. myself. Um, and so we learned a lot. And, and um, uh, it, it was largely because, as I said, they didn't pay enough money. Literally making $35 a week doing this, $85 a week doing another thing. And um, uh, what it did for me, I think, is it helped shape my career in the sense that when you, when there's that little work, uh, which there was back in Toronto then, uh, you don't get to be very good at anything. You work as an actor for a week and then there's nothing else. And, and then the, the next week you better be a singer and the week after that a host. And then the com then maybe six weeks later you get to act again. Very little production, very active, uh, little activity, completely d different in those days. Uh, and uh, so you don't get real good at anything in those days. And in a, but then I, I kind of started to like it. it. It shaped my career in the sense that ever since then, the, the fun of my career has been the variety of it, has been you know, getting an opportunity to do a bunch of things. If I ever could have been uh, you know, Chris Rock or uh, Al Pacino or Robin Thicke, I would have, but you know, <laughs> if I could have focused on something. But I didn't get that opportunity, and I, in, in many ways, I'm kind of thankful for that. But that's almost a uh, the blessing in disguise. No? Yeah. I mean, that you, yeah. I mean, that I was saying to you backstage that that me growing up because you had family living in the suburb near where I lived, and we had people that knew each other and all that. that it's not like it is today. You were a guy that was working in L.A., and that was huge to someone my age, my buddies at 10, 11, not to embarrass you, but that was a huge deal, that you were the guy doing that. And my father and my mother, who were always trying to find things for me to look at and say, hey, look what this guy's doing. He's Canadian. Oh, I mean, we all we all <laughs> said, we all knew yeah. the handful of Canadians yeah, who yeah, had gone down. Yeah. And I was part of the early wave. I wasn't the very first, but I went down in the 70s. And that background I was talking about at the CBC, one of the ways it was so valuable was when I was first in LA and I had my little portfolio of material and you go into a producer's office, I'd go into the Dean Martin office, I'd go into the Laugh-In office, I'd go into the Red Skelton office, and you're kind of demoing your resume and your material and, and they'd say, you know, this is, you know, some of this is, is kind of good, but what is it that you do? I said, well, I, I write uh, continuity dialogue, I write special music material, I write sketches, I write... Uh, no, we mean, what do you, what you do? Well, right. 
comedy dialogue and special material. And they were so accustomed, because they paid better, to everybody being a specialist. Like, you would only write comedy, you wouldn't write, uh, you know, a sketch, you'd write the monologue, and you would write the special material, and you would write the sentimental, you know, they, 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 they were uh, all categorized. So that made me valuable when I first went down, and I was a writer uh, in Hollywood for 10 years before I was ever on camera doing anything. Uh, and once again, it was, there was always an opportunity for me because I, I did something, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I wasn't just the monologue writer, and therefore I was out of work when nobody needed the monologue writer. I was uh, on, on the Glenn Campbell show, I wrote sketches, and then uh, uh, on, on a Flip Wilson show, I wrote monologues, on a Bobby Darren show, I wrote uh, special musical material, and I kind of moved around to all the variety shows because I had a great training at CBC. It's um, interesting if you're of a certain age, my age, I think between 1975 and 1977, even at my young age, I was lucky enough to see the cool kids take over the school in terms of comedy. If you think it's 79, uh, 75, you mentioned Lorne Michaels, we get SNL, we get Second City, SCTV in our country, we get the boys from Britain coming over from Python, and I said this to you backstage, the list would not be complete in that period without Fernwood tonight which is, please applaud. And oh, sure yeah. a lot of Can you tell me, uh, that was even as a young boy, my friends and I realized we were seeing something special and different, because the 70s were great for comedy, all the family and mod and everything, but then you guys come along, as I said, in that little period, and it's like the cool kids are now taking over. And you're working with Colorado. Can you talk about how you came to such a great uh, landmark show like Fernwood tonight? I tell you, I was uh, producing a show for CBS, uh, called the Bobby Vinton Show. Remember the Polish Bobby. prince? Boy, ya, droga, ya, chico, huh? And also, roses are red, my love. Right. But that was Bobby Vinton. He had a bunch of hits, and uh, but he was kind of a straight-laced guy. And uh, I got a call one day from Norman Lear's office, and said, Norman would like to meet you. And uh, so I came in, and I said, hello, Mr. Lear. He said, I just, I had to meet the guy who made Bobby Dar Bobby Fenton funny, because we did kind of a comedy show. And, and Norman was very impressed with that, that we had taken a guy who was that straight. And I had a lot of tricks, I did, you know, things. Uh, I had uh, uh, the opening of the show was a, a, a big heavy set guy who would polka in a complete leader hose and hug, who would polka the guest out and just dump him there. And I was played by John Candy, uh, John Candy. Uh, so uh, uh, we, we did, you know, some weird things on the show. Norman was impressed, uh, invited me to uh, write and produce this show called Fernwood Tonight that he had an idea for, and he wanted it to be purely improvisational. Um, and uh, that, you know, he would, for instance, it was a fake talk show. Martin Mullen, Fred Willard, and he wanted uh, Martin would be uh, uh, the host, and the water commissioner from the small town of Fernwood would come on and. They'd improvise the problems with the water, and mm. wow, that didn't sound funny to me. That sounded, you know, kind of scary. Uh, even though, I knew, you know, if you played it perfectly straight, it, it could be funny, but you still needed a bit of an edge. And I remember I was out to, having to be playing tennis with a group of people uh, as we were starting out that included Carl Reiner and Mel Brooks, and, and, and Bancroft was there, and so we're talking. And I said, they were good friends of Norman's, and I said, you know, Norman has this idea, and I'm going to be producing it, Fernwood tonight, and improvisational talk, and he said, Alan, wait, hold on a second. Mel and I are the funniest improvisational actors in the English language. We can go for two hours, and we'll have you on the floor. You won't be able to breathe, you'll be laughing so hard. Or, we can go for three days and not get a laugh. So that's the nature of improv. Mm -hmm. And you tell Norman that he's crazy if he thinks that he can get 22 minutes of content every day, five days a week, out of a totally improvisational show, it won't be any good. Uh, and that scared me enough that I started writing the show. Mm -hmm. And we wrote it verbatim, uh, that first week of shows that we were getting ready to tape. Uh, Norman saw the scripts, he said, this is crap, this is not what I had in mind get in the studio, get the first week done, and then you're out of here. 
So we went in the studio, we shot the show, and the audience loved it. It was a, an instant hit. Norman was in the back of the audience and he saw it, and then he, he sent me scripts the next day. He said, I don't know what this show is. I don't get it, it's not what I had in mind. <laughs> but the audience loved it, so I'm going to Tahiti. Yeah. That's and, a comic genius like Norman Lear is saying this to you. Yeah, right? That's yeah. a nice I mean, comment. That was such a stamp of approval and, and such validation for me. Uh, and the show was a hit for a couple of years, and we did some uh, wonderful things. And uh, Norman, uh, he's such a good guy. I mean, he really is one of those guys who stands up for what he believes in politically and socially, and he puts his money and his energy where his mouth is. Always very involved with the Democrats, which is why he's heartbroken today. <laughs> but uh, uh, even after all of these years, um, Last year, Norman did two terrific things. First of all, he came to my birthday dinner, 92 years old. Wow. He came to my birthday dinner, and then when my son Carter was applying, wanted to go to college at USC, he was a, a freshman last year, uh, I, I pulled in all of the favors <laughs> that I've been saving up for years to write letters of recommendation. His marks were okay, <laughs> but a few good letters wasn't gonna hurt. And Norman, who has a building there, in the Norman Lear Arts Building. <laughs> and he would be a good bet to, to get Norman to write a letter. So Norman wrote a letter of recommendation. I also, I, I, I wanted to get from all walks of life. So I had Bobby Kennedy Jr. <laughs> wrote a letter. I had Marcus Allen, the Heisman Trophy yeah, winner, still a big uh, hero there. Frank Geary. Uh, who is uh, architect? I mean, is Can a, yeah, 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 Canadian, by the way, from <laughs> North section area. People here, yeah, Northern Ontario. So, uh, yeah, I pulled out all the stops and uh, got the kid, and now he's majoring in beer pong at, the, uh, at Sigma Chi. But uh, that, Norman, the completely stand-up guy, and uh, I was. I, I always considered it the most flattering thing anybody could have said was when Norman was quoted in Time magazine as saying that of all of his shows, all in the family, good times, mud, mm -hmm. you name it, Fernwood was his favorite. Wow. And I think it's, it was because of we're living on the edge and the improvisational, we still improvised a lot, but we, we then went into every show with a written script from hello to good night, and then we let the guys improvise beyond that, and they always gave us a couple extra good minutes. But if you have, if you've never seen uh, Fernwood, it was probably on YouTube or something. But it was the kind of the forerunner of uh, Larry Sanders' yes. show and uh, all of the shows that you've ever seen that are like behind the scenes at a talk show. Um, uh, this was kind of the granddaddy of them. It was, and and not to go on too much more about it, but I, it, it was so it was played so seriously. Uh, like you had uh, Frank DeVol, yeah. who did all these great uh, theme songs, like My Three Sons. And he wrote all these, and there he is, this happy kind. Well, playing it seriously, the, right? The, right? The, the band leader. The, the, the secret of that show is that it had to be played absolutely straight. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, I, I can thank Kirkland Lake for part of the uh, inspiration or, or the tone that I was able to bring to that show because I remember in Kirkland, first of all, I never saw a television set until I was seven years old. And when I did in, in Kirkland Lake, here's what you saw in, in the morning. Uh, your, your TV would be uh, uh, here and you'd, you'd turn on your TV and you'd watch it be black for a while. And then the screen would flicker to life and you'd see a, a hand in, in front of the, the lens, obviously, and then it would pull back and this figure would walk around and park himself in behind the desk. It was the mayor of the town. <laughs> and our, low, our TV consisted of the mayor flicking on a camera, sitting back there, and then taking phone calls. You're, there's a poodle missing on 3rd Street. <laughs> and it answers to the name of Dory. I don't know. <laughs> Find him. And that, that, the small town simplicity, the nature of what I learned and, and grew up in, mm -hmm. was what Fernwood was all about. So it was critically important to, to play it straight, to never go for the joke. Uh, we had a couple of people who bombed on the show so badly that we kind of had to edit them out. Really? <laughs> very, very funny people, uh, but they were accustomed to doing jokes. And that was uh, Phyllis Diller, mm -hmm. Joan Rivers, 
they didn't do well on that show because they were coming out and, and going for the joke. And, and the secret of Fernwood was to play everything dead straight. And the first week we had uh, an iron lung pianist who was in an iron lung and playing the piano like this. And we had to, we treated it all, all perfectly straight. We had a bit called Leisure Suits Cause Cancer. And we, uh, and our, our, our fantasy there was that when you get warm, the hydrocarbons uh, <laughs> the start to melt and evaporate. Yeah. And you inhale it and you get cancer. So to prove it, we had little rats dressed in leisure suits <laughs> and they're going, you know, running around in a, a, a cage. But the point was that the, the, the scientists who came on had to treat it all completely seriously. Our biggest challenge um, ever in, in casting uh, was with a couple of incredibly talented people who we could never use because we, we, we couldn't kind of focus on, on, on a character that was credible, that was believable. Uh, one was Michael Keaton, mm -hmm. and uh, the other was Robin Williams. Wow. And the problem with Robin was, and this is before Mark or Mindy or any of that, he'd come in and audition for us, and he was, you know, all over the place. He was doing Robin Williams, he was quite brilliant. He made us laugh, but it wasn't what that show was about. Right. And finally, to my great credit, I came up with an idea that uh, that worked for him, and and, and 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 so he did do a number of uh, appearances on the show, and uh, but it was it was credible. It was harnessing all of his stuff under one umbrella. The idea was that he was the mayor of a, a, a pot smoking community, a beach community uh -huh. in Southern California, uh, called Yucca Luna. And uh, he was the mayor of Yucca Luna. He made, you know, the, the population of 85, but they were all potheads. And uh, uh, therefore, he could come on the show and do whatever he wanted, because we had justified that he was, he was going to be high all the time. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, he was quite wonderful. But uh, thanks for bringing up Fernwood. Sorry to take up your time. Oh, that yeah. I haven't seen it. But Is everybody seeing it? I'm sorry. If you haven't, if, it, we were saying backstage that, and Alan didn't know. I, none of us know why it's not on DVD because it would it would kill. I, I guarantee yeah, it's you. It's still his uh, favorite. He'd love it. And then we did have a number of um, uh, people that we kind of discovered or mm -hmm. launched. I mean, uh, again, Robin before he was famous, Gary Coleman, uh, Corey Feldman. We yeah, used yeah. them as little kids on the show doing Fernwood Junior or something. Yeah. And within a year or so, they had uh, their own shows. But, uh, and, but I've missed a couple uh, over the years. I remember I mentioned John Candy, and John used to come to me all the time and say, you know, I'm, I'm funny, I can do more than just do the polka. I said, John, please, I gotta, you know, I gotta service the Polish prince here. Uh, so we never used John for much more than uh, he did. There was a kid in, in Vancouver, uh, when I was here producing the Rene Simard show, which was a yeah, Rene Simard Simard show. Uh, and uh, the young kid kept coming in and auditioning every week and said, look at me, I can sing, I can dance, I can act, and I'm funny. And he was like about 14, and I said, yeah, you're great, but I already have a 14. The 14 year old is the star of the show. Thank you very much. What's your name again? Michael J. Fox. Uh, so we never used him on the show. And then um, I had the same uh, experience on the Alan Thick show, mm -hmm. the talk show that I was doing out of Vancouver. And, uh, uh, there was a guy that it took me a while to find a comfort level of having him on the show because he came into audition and he was manic and he was all over the place and kind of crazy like Robin Williams and finally found a spot for him. But there were a couple of times I, I had to say, thank you, just leave your name. What is it again? Oh, Jim Carrey. Okay, <laughs> don't, call, don't call us. <laughs> but you know what's so funny, Alan, and, and, and you mentioned Robin and Jim Carrey. These guys are all, I've always said the great comedians are all, most of the time, great actors. If they can, if they can harness that. Yeah. Robin Williams made some fantastic movies, but you look at the early work. Same thing with Jim Carrey. No one's putting a harness on these guys, and 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 they're just that's this their spirit. They're out of control. So Fernwood, uh, your your talk show, it, it just wouldn't fit. Well, yeah, and they they you know guys that brilliant all need to be directed, and yeah. as you said, harnessed and. And with the right direction or writers and producers, you know, you find that role for them and then they put all that manic energy and, and, and intensity and intelligence into a role and, and uh, great things happen. Got several more decades to get to. But I, I have to ask one more thing. My, my TV colleague, Lita, and I were riding up today of 
we were just looking up about Fernwood. I must ask you if you can answer me about this. How did you get away mid seventies with some of the stuff you guys did? There's a bit you did where a, a man of the Jewish persuasion, his car breaks down in your town, and it's not anti-Semitic, but it's a small town where yeah. they say they have those people calling this. This lovely woman calls up, and uh, I'm <laughs> sorry to have to tell you another I, Fernwood story, but yeah. this is uh, <laughs> this will be the last one. But this is one of the funniest. Uh, here, here's one. what happened. Fernwood was so small they had never seen a Jew. <laughs> So uh, on the occasion of a guy passing through town, salesman, whatever, who uh, was speeding, and uh, a cop pulled him over, and they decided that, well, instead of sending him to jail or finding him, uh, wouldn't it be great if we had him on the TV show, just to show other people, the residents of Fernwood, how normal Jews were, and that they were just people like you and I. And so they had this guy on, and, and they didn't know how to talk to him. And uh, so it was a you know, very simple, plain looking guy, not uh, outstanding in any way. But uh, when our brain dead uh, co host would talk to him, he'd say, So, um, what's with the beanie that thing that you wear? You know, it's questions like that. Or, uh, uh, what about Barbara Streisand? You know, like Barbara Streisand? <laughs> and, and, and those are the kind of questions. And then, the, then the, they would open up the phone lines and say, uh, okay, here's the number to call. Talk to a Jew, you're on the air. And people would phone in. So the whole point was just showing the stupidity of identifying anybody by any one feature, whether it's their religion or their color. Uh, and it was quite controversial, yeah. that, that bit. Uh, we did that, audience howled, uh, and we got questions and, and uh, the controversy in the, in the press. and. Uh, the same thing. How could you dare insult our Jewish friends like that? We also got a commendation from B'nai B'rith. Norman nice. got an award from B'nai B'rith saying thank you for shedding light on the kind of bias yeah. Yeah. and prejudice that we uh, sometimes go through. So uh, the, the liberals got it and the others didn't, mm -hmm. but uh, it was fun to stir the pot a little bit. You know, when I look at old clips of uh, Carson and people like that from that era, uh, your show, if you never got a chance to see those kind of shows, I really do miss when people would come on shows like yours where there wasn't really anything they had needed to push or plug. And you come back to Canada in 1980 to do the uh, Alan Fix show, and all you have to do is, I, I, was, I picked out about three or four names and said, in two years, this is the variety you had. In two years, you had Yvonne DiCarlo, Joe Namath, Margaret Trudeau, Pierre Burton, and Will Chamberlain yeah. in a two-year period. I, Muhammad Ali. Uh, Muhammad Ali. Yeah. Uh, and, and this is what, it, the talk shows aren't like that anymore. Joe well, Namath comes on, he's not plugging anything. He's Joe Namath, he's coming on. Or you're getting Yvonne Carlo on just to talk about her career. You don't see that anymore. The old talk show, even before my time, Steve Allen and the early days of Johnny Carson, Jack Park, they were actual, that's why they called them talk shows. Because they would just chat, they would have smart people on who had things to say and opinions and could tell stories, raconteurs, uh, and they would talk. And that's what made those shows uh, work. They're not talk shows anymore, they're comedy shows. Uh, they were comedy shows when I left Vancouver from the Alan Thick daytime show and we did the late night show called Thick of the Night. Um, and I, I wasn't a stand-up comic. Uh, I mean, I, you know, I can do my 15 minutes, but I didn't have that training, I, and I was really lousy. And uh, uh, the, the show lasted for a full year against Johnny Carson, yeah. but I was never cut out for late night, and it was interesting that for years afterward, I was such a, we did so badly, <laughs> that for years after, anybody who got offered a new talk show, they'd call me, they'd take me out for dinner, they said, what sucked about your show? How did you blow it exactly? <laughs> what should I do differently? And that was Arsenio Hall, Pat Sajak, Dennis Miller, yeah, yeah. Rick Dees. They were all friends and they all took me out and said, how did you blow it? So that, and uh, it is simply that, and the reason that none of those guys have worked either mm -hmm. is that late night TV is a comedy medium. Yeah. Um, they're going, uh, you know, the, the guests will come on because, as you said, they need to promote things. But they're not there just to chat, they're there to promote and to be a, a, a part of a sketch or, a, a, and, and it's a monologue, you don't even really talk to anybody till about 25 minutes into a show now. That's right. You yeah. know, there, there's a, an eight minute monologue and then they do a couple of bits uh, and then Jimmy Fallon just keeps playing around. I mean, he's yeah. kind of reinventing 
uh, the genre that way. But it hasn't been a talk show for a couple of generations. The afternoon is still a talk show. Steve Harvey will uh, still talk. Ellen DeGeneres mm -hmm. will have conversations. But uh, otherwise, those are uh, those are comedy shows. And, and guys who don't weren't trained to go for the jugular. And my mama wouldn't let me say some of the things that I would have. Yeah. And, you know, and, and also insulting your friends and making jokes on behalf of people you you, you know and hang with. Uh, I was never either comfortable at it or good at it. Yeah. And when your luck is bad, we, you know, we, we, as I said, we, we lasted a whole year, which is more than a lot of shows do now, but there was a commercial used to come on in the middle of the show that kind of summed up my whole year that year, what happened to me. There was a commercial that people thought it was a sketch. I swear it was absolutely legitimate. Uh, it was for new lightweight feminine napkins. <laughs> And the voiceover, the announcer would say, in the middle of every one of my shows, would say, once you've tried new lightweight, you'll never go back to thick again. <laughs> oh, no. oh, are you serious? <laughs> middle of my show, that's, that's kind of the way it went. <laughs> Do you, uh, I mean, listen, you've had a long career, and there's always going to be peaks and valleys. I, I remember being struck, even at the time in 1983, by the fact, I mean, Carson was, he'd lost a step, but there was so much heat. And, and pressure on you coming down there. Well, I remember that's 30, couple, 30 odd years ago, but I remember again as a, as a 17, 18 year old boy, I remember my buddies going, how is he, how is he putting up, how is he able to cope with this? Because it was Carson you were going up against and you were a Canadian. The producers of the show did a very American thing. They bragged a lot and they set up kind of a conflict to get attention. Before we ever went on, there was months of uh, of press saying, here comes this guy from Canada, he's going to knock Johnny Carson off. And that was just completely the wrong thing to do. It was offensive on several yeah, levels. Yeah. A, Canadian. B, unknown. C, knock off Johnny Carson, the god of late night. So I, my very first monologue, very first night, I said, by the way, whatever you've been reading, I'm no Johnny Carson, and I don't plan to uh, take him on. I just hope that we carve out a little niche here for ourselves, and, and to some degree we did that. Uh, but that was also the beginning of the late night wars that really uh, reached the peak between Leno and Letterman. Uh, uh, you, you, if you were on my show, you couldn't, you would never get booked on the Carson show. Really? Anybody who was on Thick of the Night would be blackballed from ever mm -hmm. being on the Carson. They don't do that anymore because there's so many shows that if one show tried to, you know, Jimmy Fallon tried to uh, blackball you because you did Kimmel uh, or, or Colbert or anybody else, and the actors say, fine, there's plenty of shows for us to do. Back then there were only two of us. So uh, yeah, he was able to uh, exercise a lot of weight and leverage. It especially showed up in the area of music. Mm -hmm. um, uh, back then, you know, there were pretty, you know, kind of old school ballad crooner. That was the kind of music. Music was just a filler. It wasn't ever intended to be a feature of the Carson show. So you would have Tony Bennett or Tony Tennille or Tony Orlando. If you were named Tony, you could get on the Carson <laughs> show. Uh, and so we would get the leftovers. We would get the people that Carson wouldn't book and didn't want. Like Red Hot Chili Peppers. First ever appearance was on my show. I did not know. Really? Wow. John Bon Jovi. First appearance. Oh, wow. Frank Zappa, uh, and James Brown. I got the day he was teaching me how to do that thing with his shoes. Uh, so anyway, we, we actually made a bit of a feature out of the music. The music was really uh, quite successful, a bit of a draw on our show. Uh, musical director was David Foster, local boy. And, uh, so, uh, so that, that was one of the things that worked, was uh, plowing new ground in late night television for uh, acts who weren't named Tony. <laughs> <laughs> you, Alan, coming in, and even at that point, you've got you know, a dozen years under your belt, producing, writing, everything. Um, were there a lot of chefs at the table, kind of, so to speak, when you went down there to do that show? I mean, you were used to running your own ship. Were there too many people at the table from Hollywood going, Al, we're doing this real quick? I remember your desk was, was different from what I had seen you. I we remember had, that all these years later, yeah. your desk. Well, you know, uh, the, 
every year, and especially back then, you know, all of the critics, the press would be, well, there's nothing new in television. It's all redundant. They're doing the same. So we did some wildly different things. Okay. And uh, they criticized that. I, uh, you would have hoped that somebody would have said, well, they, we give them credit for trying some new things. The, uh, I, I, the, the critics hated the show. I have one, one review that a guy actually tried to pay it a compliment. He said, <laughs> He said, Alan Thick has a nice self-defecating sense of humor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Self I wrote back and said, well, thank you, and we're improving excrementally. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, they were, they, were, uh, they were rough on us, but we, you know, we, were, we were trying yeah. some new things, you like know. being not entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> um, I must admit, I've never seen this movie, but I'm reading up about you. I think this was a turning point for you, so to speak. So when you, you leave the show, we should also mention you're writing uh, theme songs for a variety of television shows, Facts of Life, uh, different stories. was Norman Lear. Norman put me in the theme writing. Reason. Really? Yeah. Uh, and, and I didn't realize this. You wrote the, the score for Wheel of Fortune? Uh, I wrote um, uh, the Different Strokes, which I also sang. Yeah. I wrote Facts of Life. Uh, I wrote the original theme song to the Wheel of Fortune uh, when it ran for eight years on NBC. Chuck Woolery was the host. Chuck Woolery. Before Pat Sagan. And uh, when Merv Griffin, who owned the show, saw how much the theme song was making in royalties, he dumped mine and put his own on. And he's dead now, but I might be <laughs> No, it was, uh, it was a good business. I, I, I wrote about 45 themes all nice. together. And uh, uh, those are some of the better known ones. I wanted to ask, well, I was leading up to a movie, as I mentioned, I had not seen before, called The Calendar Girl Murders, uh, which you did, and we're going to get to your long-running sitcom in a second, but I would not seen this movie, but it, everyone, everything I read about that movie, it was that this was a turning point for Thick as an actor, yeah, and letting people been. see you. It wasn't, was wasn't only me, Sharon Stone was in that yeah. movie, and uh, uh, Tom Skerritt, a, a few Good people actor. who were, you know, kind of just finding their way. How did that come to you? Um, I don't even remember. I guess some uh, Cracker Jack agent uh, <laughs> must have said, right. hey, think it'd be good for that. I think it was a detective. In yeah, yeah. Calendar Grover, uh, as you would expect from the title, a centerfold was getting murdered every month. <laughs> <laughs> I had to crack that one. <laughs> <laughs> and, that, and that's... You know, a serious role for you leads you to a show that a lot of people grew up with called Growing Pains. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, it was a, it was a lifesaver. Yeah. Uh, because it happened right after Thick of the Night was canceled. Uh, fortuitously, Joanna Kearns was also kind of in the same boat. We were both freshly divorced, freshly canceled. Uh, worried about what the hell we would do the rest of our lives, so we instantly bonded and uh, spent extra time rehearsing to get our characters right and trying to have some chemistry. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, still see her today, saw her a week ago on the, yeah, yeah. on the golf course. We live in the same neighborhood in uh, Santa Barbara. She directs a lot now, both comedy and drama. You'll uh, see her credits around. So, uh, great gal, and uh, I was lucky to have her. Uh, were you just, yes, I'm in, read the script, yep, this is something I want to do? Well, I, I was in pitching another show altogether to uh, uh, ABC, and they said, yeah, we, we like that idea, that's okay, we could develop that, but you know what, there's uh, this other show that they're looking for a dad type, and I uh, said, hey, you know, it's... I could be driving the Samboni for the Kings <laughs> next year. I better take yeah, yeah. it. Uh, so it was uh, uh, an opportunity, and I liked it. I, I think the Jason Seaver character always was close enough to who I am or who I would aspire to be if I had 12 writers telling me what to say all the time. <laughs> but the kind of parent and the kind of values, uh, I, was, I was proud of the role, and I identified uh, with that right away. Do you find when uh, you play a role, like it was on seven, eight years, do you find that, as you just mentioned, that even though you have the 12 writers or whatever, is that you become, you start to add more and more? You see that with long running shows that uh, Alan Alda, his Hawkeye, becomes more sensitive and less jokey and, and 
slapsticky, right? And do you find it? Do you yeah, find I think it's uh, you know, unless you're playing, you know, The, the Walking Dead, <laughs> unless you're a zombie, um, and if you're playing a real character and trying to bring some reality to that, I think that over the course of a, of a year or two, mm -hmm. uh, maybe you take on some of that character, but that character definitely starts to take on more of you. Right. And the, uh, the writers on Growing Pains were always nice enough to humor me, and every summer they'd say, come on in and we want to hear if you have any story ideas, you have anything you'd like to do. So every summer I'd go in and I'd pitch them a story or a couple of stories, and they'd, they'd write one. Yeah. Uh, I didn't write the whole script, I just wrote the story. And uh, a couple of memorable ones that I was uh, proud of. There was one um, in which there was a rock star coming to town, and the young son Ben who was a big fan, and and I knew some people, so Jason had a chance to take Ben backstage and introduce him to this rock star, and that, that made me a hero. So I did that. We take uh, we take the kid backstage, and uh, it turned out to be not good. The guy was drunk and he was uh, yelling at his girlfriend. I mean, if we were doing it today in cable, it would have been domestic abuse and, and, and that. I mean, that, that's sure. a, we, we went as far as we could go showing what a bad guy this guy was. So then the quandary, the crux of the story was, does dad expose this, this guy who's such a creep? Uh, uh, or do you protect your 12-year-old's fantasy of what this guy might be. Mm -hmm. And so that became the, uh, the, the quandary in the episode. And if anybody uh, saw that or remembers it, you know who played the rock star? Brad Pitt. <laughs> I still have my oh, t-shirt that yeah. we supposedly <laughs> bought at the concession stand with Brad, <laughs> Brad's face. On. So there's now, now I, I, I'm trying to remember, would that have been pre or post Brad Pitt on Dallas? Because I remember he had a little stint on Dallas to where uh, the, people, 80s, the best looking people on the planet could look silly in the 80s. This would probably yeah, be after, after that, that yeah. yeah. Wow. Was he, was he good to work with? Oh, he was great. Yeah. You know, we, we uh, uh, the, the show was so popular that any young kid actors and, and their agents would always want them to be on the sure. pen. We're, we're getting 25 million viewers a week. Nowadays, you're a big hit if you get 5 million. Yeah. You get five million, you can stay on the air. Um, uh, and, and, you know, there, there are shows that are hits that you probably haven't even heard of because there are so many uh, choices now. You can really uh, cherry pick what you want to watch and follow. And uh, so back then, everybody wanted their kid stars to be on Growing Pains. And um, we, you could always identify who the nice ones were that you really wanted to root for. You know, a yeah, 14 sure. year old comes on the show, eh, he's got nice manners, he works hard, he came in learning his lines, I, I hope he did well. And there were a few kids like that who did do well. Uh, Heather Graham, uh, uh, Hilary Swank, oh, yeah. uh, Matthew Perry, Brad Pitt. Um, uh, we had a record that Leonardo DiCaprio. That's right, yeah. We had a full year. We was, had that, that was his first, that was his first Pretty much professional. Yeah, as yeah, as that TV. was the beginning for yeah. uh, for Leo, and uh, so you, you you know you knew who you wanted to pull for, because there were also a lot of creepy little turds, you know. <laughs> like, uh, they would take the top off the muffins, and they would, uh, not, and, 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 and they usually you could usually see the genetics, because the stage mothers and fathers were, uh, yeah. <laughs> wouldn't be your favorite people either. But so we all, <laughs> the, the regular cast, we'd take bets. That one's going to make it, this one. <laughs> so uh, uh, we, we got to see them all. It's funny them. you say that, and I'm not putting you on the spot here, but my belief has always been when you hear people say, well, fame really changed them. I, I don't want to sound bad here, but I always say that, no, I, the person was probably a bit of a bad guy to begin with. Don't you think? I mean, you've been around long enough. That this, it made him just a worse guy. Well, you know, the, 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 in, in the larger sense, even, there'd be a lot of people uh, outside of Hollywood who say, oh, he's gone Hollywood. Yeah. Well, I believe that uh, given the opportunities and the things you can get away with, yeah. with fame and money, Donald Trump, um, <laughs> that the, 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 a lot of people would fall into yeah. those kind of behavior patterns. You know, you, you'd be in a small Kirkland Lake, 
They say, oh, look at all those people in Hollywood getting divorced. Well, yeah, you got some choices, and if it's not working out, you're not getting along, and you have the money for it, you're gone. Yeah. And that's not to say that it's justified, not to say that any of us uh, supports that morally or, or thinks that's the way to live, but I think it is human nature that given enough opportunity and give, uh, you know, given choices, uh, people make them, and that ends up being called going Hollywood. Uh, I, I, and I think you're right that uh, your, your, your real nature will come out no matter what. There are people who remain kind and, and, and thoughtful and committed. We mentioned uh, Norman Lear. Leonardo happens to be that way. Yeah. Um, so there are plenty of really terrific people who you would, uh, you, whose success you pull for for all of those reasons, not, not only talent, but uh, and, and some others who go the other direction. Yeah. Um, Looking through here, we could easily use another two hours to continue after Growing Pains, but I'm jumping ahead to, to what I've seen you recently doing. You gotta tell me, how, does, how, does, how do you prepare for reality television? Can you be ready for it? Well, say, okay, I'm I'm my the, uh, space. We've had this show on for three years called Unusually Thick, and it features the family, and it, uh, uh, they came to us to do a reality show and uh, didn't really want to do that. Uh, either, you know, partly because I would consider that, you know, my reality is too boring. Uh, you know, who wants to follow you around in your underwear waiting while you're waiting for a tea time, you know? Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I, and on the other hand, on the other hand, the real reality is way too exciting. Yeah. And nothing that I would want to share with uh, <laughs> with people, you know, on, on television. I mean, the things that, and some of it's been uh, in, in the tabloids, whether it's with Robin or myself. Um, a lot of uh, our reality, we don't want to talk mm -hmm. about or share, and, and it's not much fun. Uh, so it, it was, you know, one extreme or the other. So we said we don't really want to do a reality show, but how about if we do like a, a hybrid, a sitcom reality show? So uh, we started writing the stories, if you will. So the dialogue was still improvised. None of it is scripted, we're still making it up. But I wrote and outlined the stories in a traditional kind of sitcom way. Right. Uh, where you had an A story and a B story and an ending and they all tied up together. So we didn't do a pure reality show and I didn't have to prepare much for that. So basically saying here's A, we're gonna get to B, but the dialogue yeah, between yeah, them, right? we, so. We, we knew every day when we uh, went to work what story we were trying to tell, you know, sure. what, what that scene was supposed to be. Um, and then uh, it was, it, the, the dialogue was still fresh and off the top of our heads. When you look back at um, the last 15, 16, well, basically since the beginning of the century with TV, and I, I think looking back, things like Survivor were real game changers because that really did spawn all these like Kardashians all his life. Um, did you see that coming? Did you, you've been around long enough to know trends and see things. I mean, look at what Fernwood led to and all that. Did you see no, it just exploding the way I mean, uh, who would have known? And TV has moved very fast and blossomed, and I personally think that uh, television now is better than it's ever been. I agree. It's also probably worse than it's ever yep. been, but it's definitely better. The quality uh, it is remarkable, especially in cable, and network is just trying to keep up. I did a pilot uh, called This Is Us, that's a big hit now on NBC. Yeah, yeah. Tough to do because cable is able to get away with such drama and, sure. and, and sex and mayhem, uh, and the networks still have to follow more of a middle ground path. But um, uh, it, it's, that, that's why it's tough. Uh, the networks are losing audiences because they can't compete with the content uh, of cable. But I think that the quality of television across the board is better than it's ever been. Better writing, better acting, better directing, uh, better uh, technology, a lot of CGI. So uh, definitely uh, uh, worth watching. But who could have predicted 15 years ago that uh, reality television would stick the way it has? Who could have predicted that there'd be an entire network devoted to food? Yeah. <laughs> or that there'd be this many musical competition shows on the air? You got Idol, you got Voice, you got. Uh, you have 15 dance shows, you know, yeah. sure. So, uh, yeah, I, and I think it's constantly evolving, but it's also uh, a, a business of imitation. So as soon as a couple of things work, you're going to see more things like that. And do you think, I mean, you were talking about television. One of the things I, things I love about television today, especially cable, 
is that it's okay for a theatrical actor or a big screen actor to, to do TV. I mean, back in the 70s when you were starting, it would, I'm sure, be unheard of for Cliff Robertson or whoever to well, it's do only, a TV show. Well, it's not only doing TV, but now actors are doing commercials. And it used to be uh, a generation ago that if an actor uh, was going to do a commercial, it better air only in Japan. And they take a million dollars to go and do a spot that only aired in some foreign country that could never uh, come back and compromise their artistic integrity. Yeah. You know? Uh, but they take the cash. So now with social media, uh, you couldn't get away with that, of course. So everybody's doing commercials and they're fine with it. Doesn't yeah. seem to hurt the quality of the film business. I like uh, George Clooney's attitude toward that, that I'll do that uh, Nescafe commercial because then they pay me a lot of money and then I can go out and do that $1 million independent film. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. They're all, all doing it. Yeah. Uh, do you engage in social media a lot? Um, I, 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 I tweet. <laughs> Not to the extent that uh, Donald Trump... <laughs> I don't think anybody does as much but, as Trump uh, No, I do that. I think it, it's, it's good for guys that want to make jokes. Comics like it because it's the discipline of the 140 characters. Yeah. You know? Instead of, you know, Facebook, it's fine. How many times did your cat throw up today, please? <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm registered in all of those, but I'm only active on, on Twitter. You have seen so many great comedians over your career. Um, do you think that social media has hurt? I've heard Seinfeld and Chris Rock talk about the fact that young guys really can't get out there and hone the material because if they bomb or they tank, it's someone's got a, a phone out uh, filming it, and it's on social media. Oh, yeah, it, 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 yeah. well, it's, it's not only a comedy. Nobody gets away with anything anymore. Yeah. Um, and I guess that's good and, and bad. I mean, if it's the same with all of the security cameras you see uh, out, outdoors in every mall and, and on, on street corners now where there are uh, you know, you know, security cameras uh, at the stoplights. You know, and they'll, I don't know if they're doing it in Vancouver, but in LA, they'll have a security camera. If you're speeding yeah. you're through a stop, they got a picture of you. And they'll send that along with your fine of $85. So, uh, and, and, you know, I think that's a, a good thing. I'm okay with the, uh, the George Orwell idea that Big Brother is watching. Because if you're not doing anything criminal, I'm okay to, and in public places to know that they have security cameras everywhere. Because if somebody is going to be a bad guy, uh, I, I hope there's a video of it. Yeah. So I don't, I don't mind that. But I do think that the, the imposition uh, encroachment of social media can be a little uh, more than, than would be welcome. I mean, I've uh, had a, a case where uh, I was sitting having a, a, a meeting at the uh, Beverly Hills Hotel in the Polo Lounge with a lawyer who happened to be a woman and happened to look great <laughs> and happened to wear like half a dress. And, uh, and there was uh, somebody else there who thought, you know, maybe I was catting around and uh, trying to get away with something, uh, who was taking angle shots like this, somehow sneaking or walking by and taking, taking pictures on, on a camera, put it on social media. Yeah. And, and uh, uh, got me in a little trouble uh, and, uh, you know, I had some splaining to do. But uh, uh, that, that's dangerous. That's, uh, uh, I find that to be uh, really invasive. Mm -hmm. And uh, my, uh, my son famously got in trouble yeah. uh, with a social media shot and um, uh, is no longer married. Uh, and not just for that, obviously. Maybe you have to have a body of work. <laughs> but uh, but uh, that, that was kind of the icing on that cake, sure. and a tough lesson to learn, and uh, uh, I don't know if you saw it, but it was, uh, uh, Robin was posing with a, a young lady who just wanted to have a picture taken of the two of them, so she's, somebody's out there taking the picture, and uh, there happened to be a mirror back here, a huge mirror, it was in a public place, big mirror back here. And Robin, uh, his hand had managed to rest on her uh, butt, and that was in the mirror. So when they took the picture, he <laughs> so, oh boy, yeah, rock and roll, <laughs> rock and roll. See, they, that that was never the case for sitcom dads. Rock yeah. and roll is so. Jason would do that. No, no, well, it's just so much sexier than being. <laughs> 
than spanking Kurt Cameron. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, Ro Robin, Robin now has four bodyguards to keep away the same girls I used to pay guys to go find. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Dangerous business, that <laughs> Robin. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, it's it's uh, we all go through phases, and uh, he's in a very healthy, wonderful uh, place now. And uh, yeah, Robin will ad admit that he, 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 especially around the blurred lines time, yeah. they were all partying, all having a great time. His best buddy is Leonardo DiCaprio, sure. yeah. and, uh, uh, and 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 you get caught up in that, and it, you know that he got hit with a Marvin Gaye lawsuit and a divorce lawsuit in the same year, he had the, the difficult year. And um, uh, to his great credit, changed his whole lifestyle. Yeah. And went, has gone back to making great music. Uh, bought a house out in Malibu, away from the clubs in downtown LA, and uh, has a girlfriend, and he's a wonderful father, and I'm very proud of him for all of those things. That's but he, he saw it coming and said, you know, I gotta pull it back a little bit. It's funny about him too is that he was making great music for about a dozen years before Blurred Lines. I just that it just exploded, and I don't think anybody can be ready for that. No matter how long you've been in the business. Well, Blurred Lines uh, has set a terrible precedent. Pardon me. <laughs> terrible precedent for the music business. Um, I, I was with David Foster a couple nights ago in L.A. We were talking about it. We went to the uh, Kings game, and. Um, Good old Canadian boys, we never lose our yeah. sense of values. Sure. And, uh, uh, and uh, historically it used to be that plagiarism in music was based on notes. If you used seven notes in succession uh, from another song, identical notes, then you were stealing. Uh, nobody ever tried to uh, uh, copyright a genre. You can't copyright country music. You can't copyright R and B. Nobody owns hip hop, uh, or you know, it, it, it doesn't happen. Music is very evolutionary, and it always borrows from the popularity of something that went on before blues became rock and roll, uh, etc. So uh, it was a, a surprising lawsuit when Marvin Gaye's family thought there was enough similarity between Blurred Lines with Robin and Pharrell. Uh, and an old Marvin Gaye tune, uh, and they sued, and um, uh, they're appealing the verdict, but the verdict was against Robin and Pharrell, yeah. to the tune of seven million dollars, U.S., yeah. and uh, what's that, like 23 million? <laughs> <laughs> A little more than that, actually. And, and uh, uh, so they're appealing it, but it was very upsetting, and since then, that kind of opened the floodgates. Justin Timberlake has had one, Bruno Mars has had mm -hmm. one, uh, uh, Led Zeppelin had one and, and managed to, to beat it. Skirted it yeah. uh, but uh, uh, Mick Jagger's had one. Uh, th th there are a lot, and, and it's just a dangerous precedent. I suspect that if they appeal successfully, that law will change. It'll be much more uh, succinctly defined uh, in terms of what uh, what is plagiarism in music. Sure. Yeah. It has been a delight talking with you tonight. I said to you backstage, as somebody who grew up in the 70s, uh, you were one of the few guys we could look at with the writing and producing and in front of the camera and music and everything. And uh, I thank you for all that because everything I do now, in part, is thanks to guys like you doing that back when I was a kid. Oh, so, thank you. Personally, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'll thank everybody. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I appreciate you coming up. Hanging out with us for a while. Thank you. I hope you have a great weekend. Before you go, on behalf of the Whistle Film Festival, we're, we're so honored to have you here. This is like a Thank little, you. I'm gushing right now. Um, this is a word we like to give out every year. It's a talking stick. It's made by a local artist, Squamish Nation. Um, and you give it to the speaker, and um, it's supposed to give you the freedom to speak from your heart and tell stories from your heart. Oh, and it's a bear, you? which is a leader in their community and what they do. And that's you. Now, historically, was that the tradition that you would pass this around yeah. to uh, whoever was speaking yeah. at the time? Yeah. Uh, any particular tribe? Uh, this is Squamish Nation. It's all Squamish. So it's Excellent. That's yeah. beautiful. That'll have a, a very special place in my house. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all for uh, coming up. Thank you. I can take this on my water now. Okay. And the important
question. Is there food? <laughs> <laughs>